Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, bewitching hour, seven o'clock has come. And uh, let me welcome those who are in the room here at Moorabbin, a small group as it has been since COVID basically, and a, a somewhat larger group uh, joining us online. So welcome to everybody and anyone who's joining us for the first time or after a long period of absence, you're welcome. Is there anyone here tonight who hasn't been here for Yonks? Okay, welcome. Welcome, Anthony. Oh, well, there you are. There you are. There's a lot of raffle prizes tonight. I reckon there's not a big group here. I reckon everyone's got a good chance. Now, before I uh, uh, introduce our program to, tonight, I've got some, I'd like to share with you some good news and some bad news. The bad news first is that our president, Hugh MacDonald, has had to uh, step down, not only from that role, but from the committee for, uh, for family reasons, which is unfortunate. And Stephen, Zou oh. Thank you, Sudal yeah. Lager. I apologise, Stephen, if that's not right, if I haven't said it right. Uh, Vice President has been considering stepping down for some time for various reasons and thought it was sensible to go at the same time. So that's the bad news. The good news is that uh, our former President, David Stonier Gibson, has been agreed to be co-opted by the committee to step into the role until the uh, next election. And Mick Adams, as vice president. So that's the good news. We, uh, we continue to be well served by some very capable guys and we wish, we thank uh, Hugh and Stephen for their service to, to the committee because they've both been hard working and effective and uh, hope that uh, they keep connected to the group to the best that they're able to, to do it. So, Tonight, um, we have a speaker, Mac Walton, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, he, uh, at eight o'clock, we will have a coffee break. Those who don't like coffee are welcome to have tea. Those of you who are at home have to make your own arrangements. Um, we usually have some rather nice nipples here. I, don't, I can't see them tonight. Maybe they are or maybe they aren't. And we'll, we'll draw our raffle here during the coffee break. Um, then we'll hear from our new Vice President, Mick Adams, which he'll, he'll tell us what's been going on. And then we've been trying to uh, um, shop window various uh, parts of our club. This, there's many aspects to the Melbourne PC Users Club. And uh, we'd like to showcase various ones from time to time, and tonight it's the time of the Northeast and Android SIG and Kelvin Code, Cody, Cordy um, is, will lead a presentation that uh, they seem to have put a whole lot of effort into uh, preparing for us, so that's good. And then finally, we get on to a Q&A, courtesy of uh, Stephen Grunch, I said, I said, Stuart, it just sounded like Stephen. Um, uh, and, but crunchy, I was struggling with... Gr <laughs> I'm not really good at surnames. Um, and the, the Q&A can continue after. We'll close the meeting formally at nine o'clock and the Q&A can continue afterwards if uh, Stuart and, and others uh, uh, want it to continue. <clears throat> so... That's what's uh, happening tonight. So, now to introduce Matt Walton, who's uh, sitting here with me. And Matt's the CEO of a group called, uh, of, of a technology consulting company called Dog and Bone. Dog and Bone provide independent advice to not-for-profit organisations 
on how to leverage technology. And he's been involved in the community sector for 30 years. He only looks about 40, but starting as a volunteer youth worker at the YMCA and worked his way up the organisation which saw him managing IT for YMCA nationally. Now, I'm going to let, let Matt uh, uh, tell more of his story because it's better um, coming from him. But tonight he's going to share some of his experience working with technology in the community sector and explain some of the ways that Dog and Bone has a positive impact and helps organisations improve their use of technology. So that's something that I'm looking forward to hearing. And without further ado, oh, and, and Max, Matt also suggests that um, if anyone's got questions, that they raise the questions uh, during the talk if, you, if they'd like to. And for those online, we'll have to keep an eye on your raised hands. Ladies and gentlemen, Mac Walton. Thank you, Barry. And uh, thank you, everyone, for having me tonight. It's uh, yeah, a pleasure. I, I met uh, Kirsten at a conference recently that I was on the panel of. And um, yeah, it was, it was great to hear a, a bit more about what you guys do and, uh, and the club and the, the way that uh, you, you all hear and talk about technology on a regular basis. And um, so I think there are a lot of synergies between what we do, uh, where we help a lot of not prep not-for-profits use technology uh, in their work and, and with what you do, where you help people use the technology for, for their lives. And, um, and also we've got some learnings through our work as well uh, so that we can, um, in, in terms of helping not-for-profits. So in terms of my, so I know this is different from what you would normally talk about in terms of Android and a few of the other things, but I'm hoping that uh, I can share a few few stories and a few examples of how we help organisations that might sort of prompt some thinking around um, the, how you use technology here and also, yes, some of the work that, that you do and how some of your people can use technology. So hopefully, uh, yeah, you can get something out of it from that perspective. Um, now, just my background, so I'm actually not a tech person by trade. I didn't study uh, study programming or anything like that. I actually studied uh, sports management. So I, I used to run community centres and sports centres uh, for the YMCA. But then, uh, like probably uh, some of you, I became a bit of an accidental techie when I started going up through management ranks within the YMCA. And um, we started having conversations around websites and intranets and servers and file storage and a range of other things like that. And um, I just tended to, you know, be curious about how that worked and, and take some leadership behind, all right, let's 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 explore this, let's find the right people in the room to work out what we should do with our website or what we should do with whatever other things. So when I was the National Communications Manager for the, for the YMCA Australia, um, we, needed, we needed a whole heap of technology to, to make the organisation run. And back then we didn't have big IT teams or big uh, managed service providers or anything like that. So we had to sort of work it out ourselves. And, and back then there wasn't sort of just online tools. You could go and get Dropbox or you could go and get uh, off, Office 365 online. You actually have to commission some servers in a data centre and, and make your website work that way. Or, or uh, we, we build intranets using SharePoint and we, we um, set up uh, point of sale systems in, in a whole server environment in the Rialto in the, in, in the city and had to have finance systems in, the, in that environment as well. So I was a communications manager, but I ended up running, you know, data centers and server environments and networks and a range of other things that I had to learn. Um, so luckily now I can employ people who are much better at that than I am, but um, the, I suppose the, the evolution of technology has always been that challenge where it was, back then it was all about servers and then I probably spent the last 10 years in consulting. So after I left YMCA, I worked for Info Exchange and a couple of other consulting firms, always in the not-for-profit sector, helping not-for-profits with technology. And probably for the last 10 years, I've been pushing people to go to the cloud and, and use some of these other easier 
sort of technology solutions and really trying to get, get the best value out of what, what they spend their money on, where they spend their time, how they use it, how they, uh, how they create efficiencies and, and how they pick the right solutions. So when we talk, I've got a couple of slides tonight on, on impact and what dog and bone do, it's really about helping these not-for-profits use it better, use the right tools, use the right, pick the right technologies, use that technology in the right way and, and make it as cost efficient as possible. So I, I, like you, I've probably seen a lot of bad examples of what, what people do, people spending a lot of money on bad solutions, picking the wrong systems um, and wasting a lot of money. So I, that's uh, one of the things I'm very uh, passionate about is helping people not waste money and, and not waste all this hard-earned money that not-profits get through donations or government funding or however they get their money, um, wasting that on dodgy IT providers or bad tech technology solutions is, is something that we see a bit too much of, unfortunately. So, so yeah, we'll touch on that tonight. So, um, any questions before I, uh, before I, I go through the slides? Is there another word for impact? I have a friend who just rallies against the change of the meaning of the word yeah, yeah. over the years. Yeah. yeah, so so impact's one of the words that we use, but really it's it's around what what comes out of our work. What what are the benefits that people get out of the work that we do? And I, I think when even you're talking about the the Melbourne PC user group uh, around what what do you do, but more importantly, what is the flow on effect from that? So uh, when we talk about impact, it's anything from benefit to um, yeah, outcomes as well. So not-for-profits now, including user groups and member organisations, um, the challenge now is to justify funding, justify money, justify why do you exist? And, and, and I think usually that's the flow on effect of um, what are the outcomes? So you, you guys are helping people use their technology better. What's the outcome of that? Does that mean they're more digitally connected and they can pay the bills? Or does that mean they have, a, have a, something in their life that they really enjoy? Does that mean that they've got more knowledge that then they can go and achieve some other things? So that's really what we do as well. So we, we help organisations, but we're, we're not the ones, we're not social workers, we're not psychologists, we, but we help mental health organisations to provide those services. So that's the sort of flow and effect that, that I'm referring to. So I might flick through some of these slides, but um, yeah, happy to be flexible around the, the um, all right, let's see if we can make that work. So yeah, I'll just do a bit of an introduction about Dog and Bone as well. Um, and then, yeah, we can talk about some of our impact. So this, a lot of these slides are based on last year's impact report, which is something we do on an annual basis, which talks about what, what did we achieve last year, really, as an organisation? So um, I just wanted to share some examples, some examples here. So these are some of the things that we're, we're really proud of. So Dog and Bone has been around for about 20 years. So talking about Dog and Bone, um, we, I was saying this just, just before, Dog and Bone is actually Cockney slang for telephone. So that's why the, the name Dog and Bone, I didn't name it, but uh, my, the, the owner and founder who's still around, my, my, uh, my boss, he uh, started it as a, a phone company helping not-for-profits. He helped Brother St. Lawrence, in, it was his first client. We still have them as a client, I was there yesterday. Um, so helping them procure mobile phones. So mobile phones, again, 20 years ago, were quite different than they are now. Um, but uh, so that was, that was part of his remit and we've kept the name and we still do a lot in, in phones as, as I'll, I'll touch on in a minute. So really what we're saying is for the last 12 months, we've had a, an impact, uh, apologies to your friend, uh, a benefit, an outcome of over $8.2 million back to the sector. So this is through the work that we've done, we've helped the sector basically save $8.2 million. So that's $8.2 million that the sector can then go and put, would much rather they put it towards psychology sessions or Brotherhood of St. Lawrence going and helping homeless people or those sort of things. So yeah, and, and it is a lot of money and, and this is the, uh, the challenge, I think, what we often find. Sorry. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll break it down in a minute in, in terms of across our services. A lot of it is raw cost savings through through procurement and I'll touch on it in a minute, but um, so we've got 8.2 across uh, cost savings. So this is, you know, pretty tangible money savings that we calculate. This isn't me just making, making numbers up. Um, and then um, the discount. So we, we also provide uh, 260 grand a year of discounts. Last year we did 129,000 of pro bono grants. So this is our consultants who, you know, we often bill out at, you know, $200 an hour. So we've chosen a whole heap of projects that we were passionate about that we gave that away for free. So they were in batches, often batches of sort of ten and $20,000 projects that we did for select organisations for free. Um, and that's where I'm lucky enough that I have a boss uh, and an owner of our company that that is passionate and cares and, and, and is happy for me to do that sort of stuff. So often it's in between work when the consultants aren't busy, they've finished a project, they're waiting to start a new project. We go, all right, they've got a week free. Let's go and do a security review for this for this uh, organisation or let's go and help them pick a new system or let's do a mini IT strategy or something like that for a lot of the smaller organisations who often wouldn't be able to afford to do it. So that was deliberate, that 129 is deliberately for smaller organisations who can't afford to do a $20,000 IT strategy, typically. Um, there's a whole lot of other things in there, but, but we'll, uh, we'll skip some of the other slides have a bit more detail on that. So I'll come back to that. Um, talking about our clients, so these are just a few examples of our clients. So we work in aged care, we, um, we work with mental health, like people like Beyond Blue. Um, we work in public health, so Monash Health. Uh, we've also got Alfred and a few of those guys. Um, Nexus Primary Health uh, are our customers as well. Um, Sparkways is a childcare provider. Uh, Royal Flying Doctors, uh, they're, they're one of our clients. Um, Anglicare, Brotherhood St Lawrence. So a lot of these AXO do support services. Uh, VACA are an Aboriginal um, that they look after sort of Indigenous kids. So that's not all of them, that's just a few examples of some of the, the people we work with. So we made a, actually we made a conscious decision probably, it was not long after I started, we facilitated the pro, uh, strategic planning process for Dog and Bone. And we actually, before this, we actually worked with all sorts of organisations. We worked with small companies, Large, large corporate, they worked with toll, you know, a provider at a large corporate at one point, but it was probably about four years ago, they actually said, no, let's, let's focus on not-for-profits and, and let's actually have that as a, as a strategy and let's make sure we'll prioritise that. And look, there's, I can't remember the number, but a, a million not-for-profits in, in Australia at the moment. So it's not, there's no shortage of not-for-profits. A lot of, you know, a lot of them are small, um, but a lot of them are big and, and obviously things like Monash Health and those sort of ones, they're sort of semi-government, but um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people out there that need help. Um, yes, question? What? Ah, yes, yes, uh, B Corp, sorry, I skipped over that one. Um, uh, which slide was B Corp on? Well, I think... So this one, yep. So yep. So I'll just relay the question um, just while we're waiting. So basically, there was a question around what is B Corp. So B Corp is uh, a, a nationally recognised, I think it's international now, um, certification for ethics and standards. So it's it's actually quite hard to get. So we do a review every couple of years where we get auditors come in and we have to be certified in a range of things. So across everything from our, our policies, um, around how we operate environmentally friendly, how we procure things, um, are we ethical? What do we do with the, our money? What do we do with our ownership? What, how do we treat our staff? All of those things. Um, it's similar to, you might've heard the term social enterprise. That is all social traders also have a certification, which has come up since. So B Corp was first, social traders is next. They're both very similar in terms of, um, it's a, it, it just makes, it holds us to our high standards on how we deliver our, our projects and how we operate as an organization. Um, 
And that was another thing that was really important to our, our founder and our owner to, to make sure we could hold our head high around how we operate as an organization. And also um, one of the other things is when we work with all these clients, we have to be very careful about um, staying independent and ethical. So we are, we're not a Microsoft partner or, we're, or a Google partner or a Telstra partner or anything like that. We, we are deliberately, because we see that there is need in that market um, for just someone to be independent and people come to us with, all right, what do you think? And we can give honest advice and we don't get kickbacks or anything like that. We, so we, whereas most of the time when people go and look for a system, they go to get sold to by a Salesforce, you know, salesman or a, or a managed service provider or a network salesman or, or whatever it may be. So it's very hard for not-for-profits to really know whether it's a good solution or not. So we've decided to stay in that space where we're wholly agnostic and, and ethical about how we do that. Uh, I can skip over this one as well, but it just shows uh, an example of the, the different types of services that, that uh, our clients offer to the sector. All right, so this is another one. So we're talking about impact. Sorry, sorry, Kirsten. Um, but but it's it, but this helps explain what impact what what impact is. So really across these four, what we decided to say, how can we help people? Um, and really, these are the the ways that we can help people. We can help people with our expertise, um, and sort of give away our advice. Basically, is is one of the things through our projects is what we give away. Time, we can give away our time as part of our pro bono offerings. So when we have spare time, we give that to we give that away to to, to clients. Um, money, we we actually also still donate a, a fair few money to various causes. I can touch on one later, um, but we're building um, solar system and uh, network uh, for a school in Solomon Islands, for example. I'll touch on that in a minute. And then voice is the other one. So even just doing stuff like this is part of our advocacy to um, share with the not-for-profits around what are good solutions, what are bad things. So help them think about, oh, sh you should be thinking about artificial intelligence or you should be careful of Telstra doing this or you should be, you know, so just helping educate people and our clients. Um, so coming back to the question before around how do we how do we save people money? So this is one of the ways, 7.7 .7 million. So the majority of what we talked about before in terms of that 8.2 savings is around through their telco. So these are not-for-profits who have phone bills. So people like Monash Health have several thousand mobile phones. Brotherhood of St. Lawrence got about a thousand mobile phones, uh, 1,500 at the moment. Um, and they could easily just go and get a $60 a month plan with Telstra and, and, and spend that. So a lot of what we do is help them find the right charity pricing. So you can get as low as $15 plans that we can get people on, depending on what they want. So if you ask Telstra, they'll go, yeah, this is great $100 plan that you could go on and you get all this data that you'll never use and here you go, uh, that's great. But then these not-profits are spending a, a fair bit of money. So what we do is, is um, what we help them procure better charity pricing. So there is actually charity pricing available on telecommunications, and that includes mobiles, phone systems, networks, um, all sorts of things now. So there's a lot of that's already pre-agreed, but most NFPs don't know about it, and most providers like Telstra, Optus, etc., they don't volunteer that information. So they, they're, they're not the ones that go, oh yeah, you could get a $20 plan. That's, that's not what they do, unfortunately. So. Sorry, question? Yes. Yep. Yep. Look, I think it does depend. So each different. Each, the question was around: Does it apply to sporting clubs? Um, it, there are some slight uh, sort of differences across all of these, depending on who you, whether it's a Telstra deal or an Optus deal, and some of them are applicable to incorporated associations. Some of them are applicable to non-incorporated associations. Some you have to be a charity on the ACNC. There's a whole heap of little rules depending on what it is but in general yes you you can uh get get most charity pricing for sporting associations so for example uh it's probably a 
for the next slide, but my daughter plays netball and my wife's on the committee. Uh, I just recently set them up on Office 365. They've got free licenses for Office 365 now, and I've set them up on Squarespace for a website um, on their charity pricing as well. So I think if, if you know the right plans to look for and the right things to ask for, yes, usually there's some sort of charity deal around. Um, so the other thing, actually, I'll just flick to, to telco. The other thing is just things as basic as procurement. So um, I, th I hear you've got an Android group coming up. I've actually just helped Brothers and Lawrence uh, with, a, with their mobile strategy, and we've actually recommended they get off Apple uh, and move to Android, and that is actually going to save them hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so we've helped them choose the right, the right device that does the right functions. Um, and get them on good charity pricing and get them on uh, mobile device management and a range of other things through their, through their tel actually moving to Telstra in this case. Uh, sometimes we move off Telstra, this, in this case they're moving on Telstra, but, um, and looking at who needs a phone, who doesn't need a phone, what bring your own device policy they need and, and things like that. So that's as basic as, and if you go to the Telstra shop, you're going to pay a lot more for a phone than if we can get wholesale pricing and things like that. So, look, we're not really a wholesale phone vendor. We, we, don't, we don't have a shop where we sell phones, but we help our clients find the right phones. Um, even uh, usage monitoring and things like that. So we help manage data pools so that they can, um, often Telstra will offer a really expensive plan with a big data pool, but most of the time you don't use it. So if you can have... Uh, shared data pools, you can actually save a fair bit of money on that. And looking at what are the ones they're actually not using. So one of the most common issues that a lot of these uh, organisations have, um, big hospitals, big charities, so we've got 5,000 phones, um, they're paying for ones that aren't being used. So we actually monitor what they're using and go, well, that phone hasn't been used for six months, What? or we actually do three months. Um, that person's left, why are you still paying 50 bucks a month for that phone. So yeah, that's part of our, our work as well. Um, so that, that's Telco. Um, oh, that, that's just an example of, of this one. It's quite common that we save people a million bucks over three years um, by renegotiating their plans and helping them get on the right plan. So this is an example of a Aboriginal childcare organisation. Um, and we do, we provide them with dashboards. So I don't know if anyone's used Power BI, it's a, a dashboard visualization tool that, that we present to them on a monthly basis and help them understand what they, what data they use and um, how, how they can minimize their costs. So we, we present those cost reports to them on a regular basis. Um, this is another one. So this is our tech arm. This is probably a little bit more interesting. Um, some of the other areas um, that we help people with. And I think this is another thing where our not-for-profit clients struggle with all the time. So these are four areas of impact that we've identified as what, what do charities need help with or what do organisations, including people like you, uh, organisations like you guys, or what do you actually need? need help with. And these are the four that, that we've identified. Really one of the first, uh, the biggest challenges at the moment is reducing risk and in, improving security. So it, it's things like turning on the right settings, multi-factor authentication and things like that on your, on your systems. It's having the right protection on your network firewalls and things like that. And just understanding the risk, making sure people aren't clicking on the wrong e dodgy emails. So my staff all the time, now my title's CEO, my staff are constantly getting uh, pretend emails, phishing emails they're called, um, pretend emails from me asking them to pay money. So that I think is one of the biggest risks for not-for-profits nowadays and it's something that we, we do help with security reviews and things like that. To, some of it's the technical things that we can help with, put on firewall, turn on some settings, those sort of things. But a lot of the time it's culture. It's people putting their passwords, post-it note on the on the monitor, that that is a, bit, a big risk. Or uh, yeah, sharing things or using the same password for a lot of things or making your password your birthday or some of those common things can actually, we've seen it a lot where people are losing a lot of money doing that. Um, or 
even worse, uh, losing data. So all your member data and all those things get, get exposed like Medicare and Optus. And those, so even those big companies can have issues with that. Um, the other one is around efficiency, saving time. So this is an, another big one. We've had lots of examples, uh, did a project recently where we found out they were employing four people to, to sit there and do these reports every month. Um, and this is a health provider really struggling for money, really struggling for funding. And they had a system, but the system wasn't talking to any of the other systems. So four people every month were doing all these manual work to get these reports out. And then we realized that really, uh, if you just have a little bit of integration and automate the, the data to go from here to here, you can actually get that back down to sort of one person just checks it every month. So that, that if you added up those salaries, now we're not encouraging them to go and fire everyone, but um, the, the, if you look at the cost of those salaries and the time those people are saving, there's some really simple things you, you can do and um, artificial intelligence, chat GPT, co-pilot, all of those things that are coming out now um, are really going to help not-for-profits and everyone be a, a lot more efficient. So who's used artificial intelligence tools recently? Yeah, chat GPT or something like that. Um, even we had one recently where there was a task that used to take someone, I think it was 20 hours a, a week. Um, they were able to automate that and make it at one hour a week. So that's 19 hours that person's got back in their week to do something more impactful and more important. Um, in, in communication and collaboration. So a lot of the time people used to do a lot of manual sending things back and forwards, even documents, emailing attachments back, editing something, emailing it back, you know, a lot of that sort of inefficient uh, work. There's a lot of easy free tools nowadays, off SharePoint, those sort of things, Dropbox, um, that you can use that it just improve communication, collaboration. It's great using Zoom now. So I was advocating for video conferencing long before COVID. Uh, so we've been trying to get people to use this sort of stuff for the last 10 years and um, sort of luckily COVID's helped accelerate that and now everyone's using it. So uh, it's, it's, it's great that we can communicate a lot more efficiently nowadays. Um, and the last one is decision making. So one of the things we do, we actually help procurement processes. So we help people get three quotes and run through their requirements. What are the, before you go off and buy a, a system, or find a new vendor, an IT support vendor. Um, what do you actually need? Um, really document their requirements and go through a thorough process. Otherwise, people just sign on to three contracts for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then it's with a vendor that is not what they need. And and uh, they often get stuck. Then a year later, they're with a bad system or a bad vendor, and it costs them a lot to get out of it. And and or they've really got inefficient or bad processes. So that's the other thing is we help people with decision-making. Um, IT strategies and things like that is, is really important for organisations to sit down and work out what they need, what they want, and then how can technology help them do that? So that's something that uh, sometimes gets, gets forgotten. People forget to have those strategies and have those plans in place. And um, yeah, you can sort of, drift and, and, and make bad decisions without some of those. So that's, uh, and we often facilitate committees uh, on a regular basis for these not-profits. So um, actually I've got an example here. Sparkways are a childcare provider. They run, I think about 30 kindergartens. Uh, they run a whole heap of childcare centers and, uh, and um, services for children. And um, they, were, they were, you know, doing everything really manually um, but we've we've implemented a whole heap of did an IT strategy. We provide ongoing advice, so like a CIO, Chief Executive Information Officer, as a service. So we get some of our senior consultants and myself that help them on an ongoing basis. We set up a steering committee for them to help just make some decisions around technology. We help them find a, a a new IT provider. We help them find a new childcare management system. We help them automate uh, a lot of their sign-in, sign-in out processes. So when, when the parents drop their kids off at childcare now, there's iPads at the, at the door and able to automate that. They know where the kids are. They, they can log issues and risks at any given time. They know what medication the kids want. There's a whole heap of um, things that used to be all paper, paper-based. And now these childcare workers that 
are not technology people. They're, they're in there to look after the kids. Um, they can be a lot more efficient and spend a lot more time with the kids than they can with, uh, you know, doing paperwork. Um, so I'll just touch on, yeah, these impact grants. These, uh, this was last year. We've actually, um, so this was where we gave away pro bono 129 grand um, across all of these different organisations. And we've actually changed this this year. We've actually uh, um, changed it to focus on those impact areas. So reducing risk is one, um, cost reduction is another, and improving efficiencies is another. So we've actually had two more impact rounds recently. We just finished one around security where we, we gave away, I think it was about 60 odd free um, security assessments. This is self-assessments, online tools. And then we gave away one-on-one -on -one pro bono support to help people talk through those security assessments. And we've just kicked off a, a project with a, a Meals on Wheels organisation. We're helping them with their security um, and another environmental organisation that we, that we gave project grants to where we're going to help them improve their security. Um, so that's, that's an exciting one. We did a whole heap of other ones where we did cost reduction, free cost assessments. So people sent us their telco bills and, and uh, IT spend, and we had a quick free look through it and identified where they could save some money. So we actually got one coming up, hasn't, uh, hasn't been announced yet, but this is around improving efficiency. So we're gonna get not-for-profits to fill out a survey around what systems they're using and how they're using them. And then we're going to give some advice on how they can automate and, and improve their efficiencies around that. So just a few different ways we can, uh, we, we can help. Uh, this was just one example of uh, St Kilda Mums. They're an organisation, a volunteer-based organisation. They actually had um, people that would come in and help sort out the clothes. Uh, the donations and then they would give those donations to new new mums that needed uh, new baby clothes and prams and, and uh, cots and all sorts of things. So we helped them with an IT strategy as part of our pro bono project and really helped them um, look at automating some of those processes. Tra they wanted to track their outcomes. So all the donations, they wanted to track, well, all these people who are donating all this stuff want to know what's happening to it, you know. So we helped put in a system that allowed them to track how many tons of clothes they were they were uh, doing and what impact that had when the parents um, actually got that free. How much that was worth to them and how much that that parent was getting a couple of hundred dollars worth of uh, you know new baby clothes when when their baby was born or a five hundred dollar pram or whatever it might be. And um, yeah, that, that was really help, helpful in tracking what is, what is this organisation doing and valuing the volunteer time. They all, all these volunteers would come in on a regular basis and uh, donate their time to, to sift through these, these donations and clothes. So that was another pro bono project. This is, this is one um, that uh, my boss and owner has, he knows, knew some people over in Solomon Islands. So we've been working for a few years with these, these organisations to actually, there's a school there in Solomon Islands that actually doesn't have power. So, uh, and they're quite a remote school. So we've been working them over the last few years to implement some new technology solutions around solar, solar panels, batteries, uh, network, even testing things like Starlink uh, and those sort of things. So it's, uh, it's another little pro bono project that we've been working on overseas. And, and really that's just a bit of knowledge, a bit of hands-on um, hard work and a, and a, and a good heart. And, and we've been able to have a good impact over there. So, um, And the last one, look, I just wanted to wrap up um, and I'll have time for questions and I've got uh, case studies if you, if you like, but um, I just wanted to touch on, and obviously part of this is having a think about some of these for the, the Melbourne PC user group as well and, and, and for the people that you deal with uh, and your members. But um, just want to touch on what are the, what's next for not-for-profit and what are we seeing uh, as the current trends? So I don't know if you've, you've read the news or, uh, but costs and money in this current economy are, are a real challenge. So there was uh, lots of articles about all the hospitals getting, getting all their funding cut recently. So uh, 
um, that, and that's quite common. We've had lots of very big brands that get a lot of donations and big, big organisations that do great work in the community um, have to sack big chunks of their teams. Um, just a lot of the, the post-COVID economy, uh, particularly state government funded, uh, is really struggling at the moment. So reducing costs is really important. So when it comes to what they spend on technology, they really need to prioritise and really need to make sure they're getting bang for buck on whatever they're spending, whether it's on hardware or um, on new projects or upgrades or software licence costs for their website hosting or whatever it may be, they need to make sure they're, uh, they're actually having, having bang for buck there. Um, and they're probably more likely to also, and this is where some of some of you uh, tech guys come in, they're probably more likely to go down the path of some of these low-code solutions where they can build stuff themselves or they can pick stuff up off the shelf and actually start building a, a little CRM by themselves as opposed to going out and spending a fortune implementing Salesforce or, or Microsoft Dynamics or something like that. So this is where they're, they're probably more likely to go and get a... A Dropbox solution off, you know, for free, or use the free Office 365 solutions, or some of those things, as opposed to actually paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to implement a new CRM, which is what a lot of them used to do. Um, the other one there, I've touched on it before: efficiencies through artificial intelligence. So, a lot of people are already looking at doing this. ChatGPT, uh, Microsoft Copilot is a is a popular one at the moment. Um, a lot of marketing around it, a lot of webinars and a lot of um, presentations by these vendors who are trying to promote their artificial intelligence tools. Um, but there is a lot of opportunity to, to leverage that as well around uh, AI. Cybersecurity, I touched on it before, but really just protecting organisations. Every organisation that has data, whether it's member data, whether it's patient data, um, is is really at risk, and it's uh, I've got a consultant that say it's not it's not if but when, and it's and it's how to stop it, or when it happens, how to re react and how to respond to it and how to solve it, making sure you got your backups and, and a range of other things so that you're not having to pay out pay out to uh, hackers in in Russia. Uh, and the last one is uh, leveraging data. So this comes back to impact and outcome, but um, looking at uh, collecting data, and this comes back to you know even your members here, um, what what are they what are they getting out of it? Collecting some of that data so that you can actually start tracking that. You can start doing some of these reports around. This is what we did last year as an organisation, and often when it's funding, when you're when you're looking at government funding or grants or a range of other things or even internal. Um, having the data to back up, this is what we're achieving, this is what we're getting out of this investment um, is really important and data is getting easier too. There's lots of good online tools, Azure, data warehouses, there's a lot of uh, easier data tools, things like Power BI and Tableau give you some nice dashboards and things like that to present your data in a nice way as well. So we're, we're helping a lot of organisations do that, do that too. So. Um, I uh, some year, haven't been recently, but for many years I was chair of a, a small uh, a charitable organisation providing emergency relief, counselling, family support and stuff. And uh, we had some funding from, uh, as, as well as donations from federal, state and local governments. And all of them wanted reports as to what we were doing and were dictating the format in which they wanted it. And there wasn't very much consistency between um, the different uh, levels of government. So it's fairly tricky to uh, uh, keep some data that can be readily translated into the different formats. Yeah, and, and look, I've done that myself where you have to scramble to try and uh, sometimes you have sort of got to estimate and and like two years after you've you've spent the money you've got to then try and justify what you did with it and try and sort of uh, develop those reports and and provide that evidence so uh, what we've been trying to help people with is more that 
proactive stuff up front. So it's really around as you're doing things, you've got to collect data around that. So sometimes that's um, with childcare, the great example is the sign in. So as they're signing in, they're, they're ticking boxes and they're using a system so that you can know, like, you, and at that point, you're collecting data as opposed to trying to survey people later or, you know, ask people later. So it, I, it is about what, what do you want to know? And that can be for government purposes, it can be for internal purposes, it can be just as a board or as a not-for-profit committee, what is the information we want to know? Or what do our members want to know that we can then present back to them? So um, a lot of that time is really working out what do you want to know and then work out how do we get it and how do you capture it? And this is where AI can help now and, and some of these other better systems can help. And then put in the, the processes and the systems to be able to collect that data and present that data in a, in a, in a nice way. So it is a challenge, it's always been a challenge, but uh, I, I think that the first, like, like a lot of these, the first uh, sort of question is, what, what information do you want to know? What, what are you trying to get out? What, what is your output? And then work backwards from there. I have a question. How, how do you um, help people decide whether to buy or build something? Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, one of the things we look at is um, we, we do like a business case essentially is to um, present both the options. So really information is key for, for these not-for-profits. It's working out um, they don't really know the, the challenges behind the build or the, or the buy. So it's helping them understand what is available on the market to buy, is it suitable, um, what would the implications be if we, we chose to build this and custom built this? Now, most not-for-profits, now this is, uh, I know there's developers in the room, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't be anti-develop, but uh, in most cases, not-for-profits, uh, you know, would tend to just buy something, get something off the shelf. So there's member management systems, there's CRMs, there's a range of other things. And most not-for-profits don't have developers in-house, they don't have strong people um, to, to be able to even maintain it after it's developed as well. I've seen, I've gone into a lot of not-profits where they've had a developer do something 10 years ago, but often volunteer, and then they're stuck, you know, and, they, and, they, and it's custom, so they, they can't fix it or they can't even get someone else to fix it. So um, I think if you are going to develop, you need to have a really good plan or a really good partner to be able to, to do that. I also, for a period of time, I worked in a corporate. Um, I thought I'd give it a go. I, I didn't like it, I didn't last long. I only did it for a couple of years. Um, but that was a develop, I, I did development at that time and that was, we did it for big organisations. I was building insurance systems for Host Plus Superannuation Fund and we did stuff for state government and we did stuff for, uh, you know, corporates. Um, and they just spent ridiculous amounts of money doing these developments and building these massive platforms and um, coming back to not-for-profit. It was just uh, unfathomable that they could spend millions of dollars on building a CRM. And, and so that's why usually, unfortunately, they're, they're left with what's on the shelf. And, and a lot of the time for not-for-profits, there's not a lot of great options on the shelf, um, but sometimes they may do. If there's questions in the room, put your hand up and a microphone will come to you. And if you're online, uh, Kirsten will see your, your hands go up. Um, got a couple of questions. How many people do you employ? And you sound very charitable yourselves. How do you base your fees, hourly or per job, or what do yeah. you do? Good, good question. So at the moment, we've got about twenty consultants uh, based in Northcote, actually. Um, so we're we're local. We don't offshore or, or anything. And most of the people are quite senior people that have been around. A lot of our guys, uh, you know, are ex CIOs. That one of them CIO at Medibank. One of them has worked at Deakin Uni. Uh, one of my current consultants used to um, be the head IT guy at Dyson Buses and, and you know, so they're experienced guys um, and girls and uh, they, so we, we, we do rely on that experience. There's, there's not a 
junior that we can use that's really cheap. So we do quote based on our time. Almost all of our projects at the moment are, are time-based. Um, but what we're currently doing at the moment, which is interesting, it's probably a longer story, but um, we're actually trying to get more product-based. So we've actually built for our telco, we're actually built a, a portal uh, a, using Power BI. I don't know if people know Power BI. Um, for Microsoft, it's a, a dashboard sort of tool. So we've actually integrated that with uh, some Telstra building. So we can actually, they, so in, as well as our time, they're, they're sort of buying access to a portal that provides them a lot of that information. So that's, we're actually trying to do it cheaper. So what we're trying to do is instead of people having to buy our time at a sort of consulting rate, then we're actually saying, well, we can provide the information to you and you can make your own decisions. We can provide some advice, but uh, it's a lot cheaper because what we want to do is we want to help more people and more organisations and a lot of the smaller ones. As we said, when we look at the statistics of charities across Australia, um, a lot of them are small, probably three quarters of them are have under a handful of staff or, or volunteer led like, like this organisation. So um, that those ones are the ones that can't afford expensive systems or consultants a lot of the time. So um, yeah, and yeah, we are, we do try and be charitable. Um, and luckily we've got a boss and an owner who isn't expecting that we're making millions of dollars every year, we, you know. So he's he's in it as a passion project for him as well. So we're lucky. One of the great things about Australia is that there are so many uh, charities and so many volunteer-run organisations. Yeah, are you able to uh, recommend any sort of a documentation framework for a very small? not-for-profit organisation, just to be able to document what systems they're using, what equipment they've got, uh, where they're spending the money, and um, and so, so on. It just enable a little bit better control than having things just appear like Topsy yeah. in different places and you know, work out who's actually responsible for, for what. Yeah. Hopefully in Chinese as well, because it's, <laughs> it's a Chinese yeah. organisation. Um, well, this is an organisation I used to work with actually, has been government funded um, to build some of the, some tools for not-for-profits. Part of my old role was to help um, develop resources for not-for-profits. So there's a, um, a website called Digital Transformation Hub. I don't know if anyone's ever been on there or heard of that. Um, but basically you can do a free self-assessment um, for a digital, they call it digital capability assessment, but it's sort of like, where, where are we at with our IT governance? Where are we at with our security? Where are we at with our systems? Where are we at with our resourcing? Um, and then there's advice and templates as yes. part of that, that you can download for free, like an IT strategy template, things like that, yeah. that, that are on there. So um, I can get, get the link sent around, but it's Digital Transformation Hub. It's actually uh, run by Info Exchange, um, and they got funded to do that. So I think it was the New South Wales government actually paid them to do that for their charities. Um, but that's if you're wanting sort of templates and structures. Yep. Um, and I think they also, on their website, um, there's an organisation called Connecting Up. I don't know if anyone's heard of them. Um, they give away donations and discounts. So they're the one that also facilitate the Microsoft, the free Microsoft charity yeah. licensing. So yeah. um, they, they have used that connecting up for yeah, so, getting so, software. So that was that where was I, I went for my daughter's netball club. <laughs> um, you know, I, I set up Office 365 and they've, they store all their documents there, for example, and they're using Teams. Um, for their meetings and for their sort of collaboration at, the, at a committee level. As an example, that's not right yeah. for everyone. Google's great as well. There's some good free um, Google tools. So, Do you recommend other free type software like LibreOffice and uh, Linux systems? <laughs> well, yes, but it's uh, who can use them, I think, is the challenge. Uh, I think it's, it's all about user friendliness and yep. suiting the, the technology solution to the, to the sort of the user. Yeah. So Sorry, what was that? Digital, trans Digital Transformation Hub, I think. Yeah. It could be .org.au, but I can't, can't remember the URL off the top of my head. But um, do a search. You can, anyone can contact me as well. I'm, I'm sure yeah. Kirsten can share my details if, if there's anything that people want to yeah. ask later. I would certainly like to do that. Yeah. <laughs>
but that's the challenge. There's a lot of small not-for-profit committees. I'm on another uh, committee. We've actually got a, a meeting later today, uh, later tonight, um, for men's mental health organisation, and we're uh, six six blokes. You know, have a, um, are on the committee. We don't employ anyone. We just do advocacy and awareness and help run some events and things like that. So. Um, it's that sort of organisation. We've set up a, a donation platform. You know, we've got a website. We've got uh, sort of emails and things like that. They also use Office 365. But uh, yeah, there's uh, there's lots of different ways you can do it. Uh, Joey Gold has got his hand up online. Oh yes, good evening. Good talk. Um, you mentioned a lot of um, non-profit charities. Some of them. Are you, are you, do you have any exposure to um, their donation centres and how they're trading uh, products in their donation centres? That seemed to be, in my experience, I've recently donated some stuff, it seems to be still at the grassroots and not really taking up any IT or technology. Have you got any comment on that? Yeah, I assume you're referring to the clothing donations or, or or furniture or those sort of donations as opposed to money donations? Yeah, e exactly. Or any other items that are donated to the non-for-profits that they sell in their stores. It yeah. seems to be, this is my view, that they don't really put their products on the internet for sale. People come in and browse. Yeah, but, that's, that's uh, yeah. That's a really good point. And uh, the, I had a, slide, a couple of slides ago with St Kilda Mums. They were a perfect example. And I actually touched on this at the volunteering conference because one of my recommendations when I was out there at the factory was like, well, why aren't we barcoding this? Why aren't you getting it online? Why aren't you automating some of these processes? They're still using very much paper, paper-based stuff to do safety checks on prams and things like that. And so I was exploring, well, we could get a couple of iPads in here. We could have a, an online form. They could fill things out. When you drop it off, you could scan things. So there is definitely opportunity to automate some of that. But um, one of the comments um, from some of the internal people is a lot of the volunteers um, tend to be elderly and not digitally, not very digitally literate literate. So they actually didn't want to use iPads. And so if we put iPads in, the volunteers would drop off. So they, they were sort of like, well, we, we sort of, yes, agree we need to automate some stuff, but we don't want to scare away our volunteers and we want to actually provide an opportunity for volunteers to come and get together. We actually, they, they weren't all about the products, but they were also about the volunteers. So likewise, the volunteers that man the shops, it's actually a good volunteering opportunity for them. What are those people going to do if they're not in the shops or in, in, the, in the sorting? So some of these volunteer organisations are having that dilemma of, Yes, you could probably put it all in online shops and have some people behind this in a warehouse shipping out goods, but um, it, it didn't necessarily align with the, the vision of that organisation and, and their goals. So, but yeah, but obviously, yeah, that's right. The technology and the you know the youngins that are growing up, the eight year olds, the ten year olds, the twenty year olds, and the maybe even the forty year olds now, um, they're looking for stuff on Facebook rather than in the community shops. And if the community shops had a Facebook page and said, here's some items that might might attract them into the actual shop. Anyway, that's my view. But yeah, there's still a dilemma as far as how do we get the um how do we get those items online so that the mass the so the masses can see they're in the store. I suppose I want people to come in the store as well, but they might have some lost leaders that attract them into the store. Yeah. Oh look, I agree. And and the other dilemma that some of them have is um, some of the op shops are, are getting a little, little lazy, so they actually want uh, they, they don't want to sort through um, sort of buckets and buckets of of donations. So a lot of the time they just sell big buckets off to off to China, or you know, so they don't all end up in op shops. So uh, everything you donate in those bins don't doesn't always end up in 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 nice op shops in Melbourne. And then the flip side, I actually work in High Street Northcote. Uh, the renowned for their op shops, but now they're all super funky and very expensive, and they've they've probably got online point of sale systems and a range of other things in Northcote. But they're for the the sort of they're not for lower income people. They're for trendy uh, sort of hipsters in Northcote that uh, pay a fortune for these recycled clothes now. So, yes, it's it's definitely a challenge. Thank you.
<laughs> this will have to be the last one. Well, this is a specific question. Um, do all these small organisations with you know, half a dozen computers or so spend um, sort of a couple hundred dollars every year having someone come in and do a test and tag on all their cables? Is this something that uh, they can't get around or are there other ways and means of doing it without spending money? Uh, the testing and tagging specifically, probably not because it's, uh, it's a sort of a, a risk, a hazard, no H&S thing. So uh, the, the minute you become a, a, an association and you employ staff and, and or even official volunteers, um, you sort of have to tick some of those boxes around, uh, you know, work safe and those sort of things, unfortunately. But, um, but managing technology in general is what they often um, struggle with like those six laptops they're the ones that often the antivirus runs out or it breaks and um, and then they don't get the value out of that because they can't afford to pay someone to come and fix it or they don't have the knowledge to fix it themselves that's the uh, challenge at the moment is people have learned not to fix things so no one can open up the back of a PC anymore and fix things. So you, you <laughs> this group, yeah, is probably one of the few around that can do that. That's the challenge. So even my generation, uh, I, I'd struggle to fix a laptop myself, to be honest. So um, if it was hardware based, so a lot of the time that's, if it's not a warranty claim, they throw it out and buy a new one, which is which is sad. So uh, that's, that's the, the new, it's quite disposable now, unfortunately. To move stand no, that's right. Sorry, Matt. Um, Matt, thanks very much uh, for that. It's it's a delight to hear from somebody who's very passionate about what they're doing. Yours is not a not-for-profit company, as I understand it. It's a for-profit company, but uh, is is focusing on uh, on achieving something for uh, for your clients and for the uh, not-for-profit sector in 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 uh, in total or in general which is great um some people are also passionate about a, 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 a nice uh, glass and uh, we would just like to give this to you and say thank you very much for coming and uh, and sharing with us what your business is about thank you. okay we're back again um, as I mentioned before, uh, we're going to hear from our new Vice President, uh, Mick Adams. And uh, I don't know Mick Adams very well, so we'll ask him to uh, tell us a bit about himself, if he wouldn't mind. Evening, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Um, I'm Mick. Um, club member for about five and a half, six years, something like that. Um, happy to see more active members coming into the club. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to s that Hugh and Stephen have stepped down. Um, happy to fill the void uh, for the time being at least. And hopefully we can come up with some good things to bring the club forward. Here goes my phone. I should have put that on silent. Um, excuse me. Um, I'm not sure if David's available to speak directly to us or if he wants to, me to speak on his behalf. Are you there, David? Yes, I'm here in the North Sea, just north of the uh, Arctic Circle. Welcome, David. Uh, that's our president. Thank uh, you. David Stoney Gibson on, on Zoom from the North Sea. Hello, David. Would you like Hello, to address, Mick. Would you like to address the crowd? Oh, well, I'm not sure. Just just click the unmute button. Um, we, can, we, can, just, we can hear you loud and clear, David. Yeah, you can probably hear I've got a lump of chocolate in my face too. Sorry about that. I can't but, see um, you here, David. It's okay. Uh, yeah, I, I can get... I've got audio coming through, but the, my camera doesn't work. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, well, I think they ship some... Just for, for the interest of people uh, out there, I'm on a ship in the middle of the North Sea uh, and coming to you courtesy of Elon Musk's Skylink. 
And it seems to be producing about three megabits down, an erratic amount up. And I suspect it's got a block on Zoom because I can't get my video out. But I'm getting full video coming inbound. So it's kind of working pretty OK. And I've been hearing everything that's been going on. Mick and I have had a few phone calls over the last uh, few days using, um, oh, with Mick, I use uh, Facebook Messenger. I've also been talking to other people with um, WhatsApp. So they, it's actually it's, the level of technology is, is quite incredible. And of course, not much these left. days, most people, there's, there's no, there's not much. It's, it's a, you're right. You're right. Um, I've been running speed tests a couple of times, which is probably a little naughty on a, a ship with limited bandwidth, but I'm getting about three and a half down and two and a half to three up. So pretty good. Um, of course, we've been all been doing that on our mobile phones, and uh, that's the way it goes these days. People, young people, are not using computers much anymore. Uh, remember, from the last presenter we had from the uh, the um, communications of digital media online communications director for um, Zoe Daniel, but she said the overwhelming number of people use just phones; they don't even have computers anymore. I think that's something that is going to affect the the workings of our club going forward. Um, that's a very so, point you're making there, David. Yeah, yeah. So, um, as you know, Hugh had initiated a uh, a program to identify uh, where the club needs to be headed if it's going to still be relevant in in ten years' time, uh, and it's certainly not going to be. Um, a bunch of people like me um, sitting at home or, or even on a ship with laptop computers or desktop computers. It's all going to be something very different. Um, Is that so the, the process us? that, yeah, go, go on, you, you yeah, take that, over. You, you're speaking Your to the challenge <laughs> that we face as a club, as a committee, um, as a group of like-minded people, um, that there is the challenge that, uh, technology has changed a lot since this club started. Uh, the world has changed a lot, and we need to roll a bit with the punches. And and so, th there there are workings behind the scenes to towards a strategy to meet uh, 2035 with gusto uh, and with strong membership and strong membership involvement. Um, it's a little bit early to speak to what that exactly looks like at this point, um, and I, I hope the membership. Uh, gives us grace to um, get settled in our positions and, and David to come back to Australia and, and be in person so we can continue uh, some robust discussions and, and workshop ideas uh, as to what the future might look for, look like going forward. Uh, is, that, is that enough? So I I, I'll, I'll, I'll just interject there, Mick. Um, yep. I, I think one thing that's point that's very important to make is there is going to be an evolution of the club. There is absolutely no question about that. But what is equally as absolutely certain is that we will not tolerate the thought of taking away anything from current members and those uh, functions, those services that they're enjoying. Uh, that That is absolutely um, central to, to whatever we're going to do. So. The club in 10 years' time is going to look totally different. Uh, but if any of us are still are not pushing up daisies by then, we'll still be getting whatever services we, we um, uh, are, get, are getting now. So we, we see, uh, just to give an example, we have decided that with the email service, that absolutely will cons persist and continue for existing members and the the survey that you initiated recently point out that quite a lot of members are there for uh, largely for the email that is going to continue but anyone signing up new from i think did we decide on the first of july something yeah. like that which is yep. oh yep. it's, it's you know, current, long, yeah. isn't it yep. um they they won't be yeah won't will not be offered the email service because young you know people these days are <laughs> if they haven't got email by now, they're, they're not going to be interested in ours anyhow. So 
um, we won't be doing that. So eventually that will be able to, to be phased out and that removes one burden from the, the running of the club. Well, that, that, that's uh, an important we'll point be... you make, David, about the, the running of the club and, and making that easier on the volunteers. It's very important to offset what you're saying about uh, not continuing to uh, provide emails uh, to, to new members going forward. Um, but there's a reason for that. And that reason is that our volunteers work really hard to, to provide the services and the facilities and, and the, the talks and, and the activities, um, the projects. It's all volunteer run. And, and so we're trying to make it a little bit easier on volunteers to make volunteering more attractive uh, going forward. We need more volunteers and we need more activities. We need people to champion activities. Um, and, and there's not much of a barrier to start an activity revolving around tech in this club. All you have to do is put your hand up and say, I want to do something. Can I do this? Sure. <laughs> Kirsten? Yeah. I just wanted to mention on the Wednesdays that are not be connected, we've just started from 10 till 12. Uh, just come and chat or come and code or come and chill out or come and create something just to actually try and build up the Wednesdays that are not be connected. The big connected Wednesdays have plenty happening, but we want to make sure every Wednesday has something happening. Thanks, Kirsten. That's one, one of the things that we've, we've been doing this year is, is to try and engage more of our current members, not just to find new members, but to engage our members and, and uh, give them value um, you know, to add to a conversation or, or, or to a project. Um, and, and Kirsten's point's very relevant that Wednesdays are becoming quite popular around here um, and, and we'd like more people to come in and we'll, we'll have more projects going on uh, in the future that might tempt some members to say, oh, it might be worth travelling, you know, it's a little bit far but we might come in for this because it's interesting and that's what we're trying to do is keep people engaged, um, make the club valuable to them um, more so than what it already is. Barry, David, one of the uh, things I've been thinking about is the name of the club, because for us oldies, a PC means a, a IBM compatible uh, desktop computer, and uh, distinctly not a, a not an Apple. And uh, now a personal computer can be anything from a phone to a laptop or. Uh, iPad or, or, or anything that's still being invented, basically. Oh, there'll be more on the way, and, I'm sure. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, even the personal alarms and things you wear, you know, exercise monitors are all personal computers. Mm. But um, for, for our generation, there needs to be some uh, work done to change the definition of what PC means. Otherwise, the, the name is a bit, a bit old. Yes, and I'd like to share an anecdote from um, an earlier uh, sausage sizzle uh, we did at Bunnings, where uh, members of the public would come and we had our banner that you see on your screens now uh, at, at sausage sizzle and people were coming up and saying, what's a politically correct user group? <laughs> um, so, so Barry made a valid point that perhaps we need to look at that we don't know yet. We're still sort of looking at, at ideas and, and input from uh, not just the committee, but from interested members of the club as well. Um, I can't speak directly for Hugh's um, survey that he sent out, but I, I think there's a lot of information there that we still need to go through. Um, and, and always know that um, the committee has the respect of the members at its foremost. Uh, we, we don't intend to take anything away, we want to add. So hopefully we can encourage more people to come in and do more things. Any questions? Okay. Mick, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm, uh, I liked everything I heard and I think the, uh, the club's future is in good hands. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry.
now as, as I uh, mentioned before, we want to use this uh, uh, segment in our monthly meeting to showcase various aspects of the uh, club and uh, tonight it's the North East and Android SIG. Um, a personal comment, um, a, a SIG stands for Special Interest Groups and there's been an, a number dealing with digital photography, video, um, genealogy and, and so on uh, yeah, and many others. But some of them have merged, uh, for example, uh, at Wadham House, um, the, the video SIG I was part of has merged with home entertainment and um, hardware, I think, and uh, digital photography and all of those things. And it's become a general interest SIG, not a special interest SIG. And I, I sort of think that this is a good thing that uh, if we've got some regional general interest uh, groups that where people can uh, um, can join with others members helping members is is still our motto and cover all of the topics of interest you know then that's a really good thing and special interest groups for special interest is also a good thing and and then here at this central meeting um, we should try and do something a little bit different and and we are in getting out outside speakers as we had today uh, to talk about issues that uh, are not really relevant to helping us fix our own computers but uh, um, but but open the I've, I've lost the right words but uh, you know, we see what's going on in the world and what people are doing and take an interest in that in the area of technology. Anyway, that's my own uh, personal comment. Uh, if it wasn't appreciated, I think I'll get the sack. We'll see. But uh, today, uh, North East and, um, and, uh, and Android which sounds to me like a combination of a, a general interest group and a special interest group, um, are represented by Kevin. And Kevin, are you online, aren't you? I'm Kelvin. Online. Oh, Kelvin, sorry. <laughs> Kelvin, you're online, aren't you? Yes, I am. Um, do you want to take over? Uh, all right. Well, I can, I can start if you like to uh, Go for it. give us a bit of a picture. For those people that uh, that uh, I don't uh, I don't know, I'd like to to welcome you. There's a lot of strangers that uh, I haven't met before, and as Barry says, my name's Kelvin Cording, and I've been looking after the uh, Northeast and, and Android Sig Group for something like uh, nearly twenty years, and I'm currently the uh, coordinator for that, with a lot of help from people like. David King and uh, John Swale and so on. Um, and I also look after a website that I'll be talking about in our little video presentation. The complication with this presentation is that I'm on uh, out at Diamond Creek, for those people that know the northeast of Melbourne, on a fixed wireless service. And, of course, fixed wireless services don't provide you with a very good upload speed and as a consequence of that the pre-recorded uh, talk that we're going to give is going to be streamed by David King after the David we finish that streaming I'll come back and I'll, I'll answer a few comments that people might have and talk a little bit more about uh, where we're likely to be going in the northeast sea so I think at this stage David it's over to you and we'll see how we go at the streaming. Right, we'll go to a bit of sharing. Sharing now, you should see a black screen. You see the black Welcome screen? Welcome to this presentation about the Northeast and Android Special Interest Group. We hope you enjoy it. So now on with the show. 
special interest groups SIGs, have been a key feature of the Melbourne PC user group for over 20 years. SIG have been formed by members interested in particular aspects of personal computers and their associated technologies. Over this period, there has been many changes to both the technology and the social aspects of how members communicate and discuss their mutual interests. Tonight, we will look at one particular SIG with a retrospective eye to see how these technologies have changed, the subject matter discussed, and how these meetings were conducted then and now. The Northeast and Android SIG have a long history going back to the early 2000s, when the late Colin Lampshire, a very keen photographer, became involved in running a Northeast SIG group with an emphasis on digital imaging. In 2011, a separate Northeast and Android SIG was established, and more recently, the two special interest groups have been combined into the current Northeast and Android SIG. The Northeast and Android SIG was initially established in the Heidelberg Ivanhoe area of Melbourne to support local area members. The SIG was initially located at a church hall in Seddon Street, Ivanhoe, and in 2017 moved to a community hall in Heidelberg. In both of these locations, setting up our own video and audio equipment for presentations at each meeting was messy, time-consuming, and suboptimal. In 2022, we moved into our current location at the Ivanhoe Library and Cultural Hub, which permanently provides internet connections, video screen, etc. The occurrence of the COVID virus in 2021 resulted in a major shift in the way meetings were conducted, as members could not attend meetings in person. As a result, Zoom conferencing software was used to conduct meetings, and today, so-called hybrid meetings are conducted where members can attend in person or join remotely using Zoom. If you would like to receive reminders and details about the next Northeast and Android meeting, including Zoom link details, go to the MelBC website. Login as a member, select SIGs, then SIGs list, and subscribe to the Northeast and Android SIG. Over the years, Melbourne PC members have shared their knowledge and presented material to the Northeast and Android SIG. Here are some examples of these presentations, including topics of interest at the time. Finally, this video illustrates how we can use Zoom to prepare a future presentation for the Northeast and Android SIG. Uh, the Google Maps online and see what happens there, okay? Okay.
we will now look at our website at the highlighted address and briefly describe each page on the menu. The home menu describes what the SIG is about. The menu on the left allows you to select the various pages available. This page details the location and meeting times. The smartphone page allows you to select various topics. The various photographic topics can be selected from this page. The presentation page displays options for viewing past presentations. We will come back to view this page in more detail shortly. This page lists some useful websites for SIG members. The Files repository page provides a detailed link of how to Upload your videos for sharing with other members. Listed on the page are tips and tricks that SIG members may find useful. Now let's return to the home menu. Next, we will return to the presentation page and select a presentation to view. We will open the Northeast and Android SIG 2024 by clicking the plus symbol to open presentations available. We will select GPS Car Navigation Part 1. We are then connected to our video server where we can display or download the video presentation. So why Google Maps? Now we will return to the SIG home page and close the website. While this SIG's special interest is the Android operating system and applications, we also serve our local area members and other subscriber members with topics they express an interest in. Finally, if you would like to assist with the management of the Northeast and Android SIG, or its associated website, or have suggested topics, please send email to this address. Remember, the Northeast and Android SIG can be found at this address by loading directly into your browser. We hope to see you at the next Northeast and Android SIG meeting soon. So, goodbye for now. <laughs> well, there you are, folks. Hope you found that reasonably entertaining. Well, it was it was it was better than entertaining. It was a very professional presentation, and I think anybody who any members who live in the in your area would be attracted to go and go and join. Um, there's only one thing that bothers me. It was such a uh, a professional presentation that I think other SIGs that we asked <laughs> might think, ah, no, who's, uh, so thank you very much. All right. Uh, Th thanks, thanks very much for that, uh, Barry. Just a, just a couple of, couple of points there. Um, what you saw on that video, uh, in fact, that whole video is available uh, on the Northeast 
uh, Andro and Northeast and Android SIG site by going to the address that I showed you there. And uh, you can actually download it and put it on your own computer and play with it as many times as you like. And I'll put I'll put the addresses again for both email and for the website in the chat so that you can uh, you can uh, keep that and uh, hopefully make some use of it. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, David for, for running that. I'm hoping the government sometime will improve the service on on fixed wireless. It's it's pretty it's pretty poor at the moment. All right, so I'll uh, I'll hand it back now to uh, to you, uh, Barry. Unless anybody's got any questions, I would like to one one question. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about Murph? Murph, Murph? Murph, there is a company called Murph AI which I actually uh, scripted that whole presentation uh, as a Word document. And then I sent it off to uh, what's called Murph AI. And they've applied that text with a suitable voice that I selected and created the video, the audio that I then uh, integrated in with the, uh, with the videos. So uh, that's, a, that's a start. Uh, and, and a useful application for AI. And I'm sure, oh. as um, uh, Max me mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, lots of people will start using uh, AI for these sorts of things. And that's one of the areas that we'll be following up quite a lot more at uh, at Northeast and and for John Hall's benefit at Wadham House this coming Friday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, folks. Oh, thanks so much. That was really, uh, really appreciated. Thank you. Uh, and I'll put, I'll put the, uh, the... Kirsten, who have we lined up for next month? Do we know? Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, we've, we've got another SIG, is it? We've, we've got another SIG um, organised to present next month, so... Look forward to that. Now we move on to essentially Q and I, uh, Q and A with uh, I help and uh, Stuart. Um, I'm looking at his screen here. Is going to say something about I help itself. Um, we're going to formally close the meeting at nine o'clock. I will interrupt and do that. And the questions and answers can continue informally if if Stuart if there's questions and if Stuart's happy to, to stay. But the formal meeting, will I, I will close at nine o'clock. Stuart, thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Um, what I thought I'd do is just run through a few things, um, one in particular, about uh, our website. Now, as, as you probably all know, you can log into the website in the members area and you can get information that's not publicly available, such as our videos um, of monthly meetings and uh, you can also pay your dues on, <laughs> on the members area. So you can log in and you can change your own details, such as um, you know if you get a new phone and you can change the phone number and uh, change your email address and those sorts of things. So and a lot of people have been having a lot of our members have been having trouble in doing that. So I thought I'd run through a bit of a, a presentation, which uh, if the people up in the bio box would put. Uh, HDMI 2 up on the screen. We can see it here. Um, excuse me, Stuart. Could you just talk a little bit closer to the mic? I can barely hear you. Okay. I'll try without eating it. Uh, thank you. That's better. <laughs> okay. So what I thought I'd run through is how to go to our website, which is, of course, in the middle of the screen, I hope that you're seeing at home. That's good. Um, not necessarily, but I hope so. <laughs> anyway, 
um, how to log into the members area. So like many things, there are a lot of different ways to achieve the same end result, particularly true about computers. Uh, so we can look at two ways of reliably getting into the members area. The first way is preferred and the ideal and is rarely available to anybody. So I'll just run through this one quickly. So it's via a cleared cache browser. The first time ever that you use your browser, be it Edge, Firefox, Safari, Chrome, Vivaldi, Brave, whatever, there are lots of others too. Um, if there are no cookies saved on it, if it's brand new, there won't be any. And when you're first opening it, the cache is empty. That's the part of the memory of the browser that um, you might clear now and then if you have real problems. <laughs> so basically, you're not logged in to your browser profile. And of course, browsers these days have profiles available so that you can use the same browser for different purposes. But I didn't want to get into a lot of detail about browsers. So let's just look at what happens. So we open the browser. We enter melpc.org.au or something like that and find the website. So it comes up like this with nice picture of Melbourne or one of the other pictures that we cycle through on the home page. And if you click on the member login, what happens then is that that nice picture of Melbourne disappears and we get this WordPress, that's what the W stands for, a Word, WordPress screen. And that could sit there for quite some time, up to about 20 seconds, I've counted it. Now, the, the real, Im, really important thing to do is not fill in anything in that space saying username and password because it's not going to work because it's WordPress and you don't have the password or username necessarily for WordPress. So you just wait and soon enough, what will happen, oh, sorry, I was on the wrong page there. What will happen is that you'll get a sign in. It's a Google sign in. Let's just go back a moment. You see down the bottom there of that WordPress screen, it says redirecting to log in via Google. That's why you don't need to do anything more at that stage. So you'll get the Google login come up. And of course, you've got to use your melbournepc.org.au username to log in there. So you do that and then you hit next. Then it goes to ask your password, which you put in, if you can remember it. I hope you can. And lo and behold, you get into the members area. And that's proven by the fact that you have your name sitting along the top in the black line there. And you have the member dashboard showing. All right, now that's the ideal way. But rarely does it happen that way because rarely do you have your browser, when you first open it up, free of cookies. It's got stuff saved in the cache that is supposed to make life easier for you. But unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't. It has the opposite effect. So let's look at logging into a browser. When you're already logged into something else, whether you know it or not, a lot of members have trouble with it. So if you've got a browser profile, it's not melpc.org.au. If you're logged into a Gmail account, not melpc.org.au. Or if you're logged into some other account, maybe it's OptusNet or Big Pond or 
man on the moon, all sorts of stuff. So, for example, and I can only give you one example because there's numerous examples that could be looked at, but I'll give you one example where you logged in your personal Gmail account. And that does catch a lot of people out. So you logged in your personal Gmail account. You open a new tab. You find Melbourne PC website and you click on the member login. And what happens? Oh, access is blocked. Melbourne PC Google Workspace login can only be used within its own organisation. Now, the key point there is that you see your email address just underneath that statement and it's at gmail.com. And if you're reading that, the penny should drop to say, oh, I've logged in under the wrong address, the wrong username, the wrong domain. And that's precisely what's happened. That's why it fails. So you click the back arrow to get back to the home page. And from the home page, scroll down. Now I'm sorry, this is a static photo, so I can't scroll it down. But you scroll down and you can click on a members Google access shortcut that we've got sitting on that home page, a little bit below where you would normally see things, but if you scroll down, you'll see it. So you can click on the, and that takes you to this page, which has got a couple of login, um, or sorry, not login, but a couple of shortcuts. One for the um, Google Workspace email, and the other for Google Workspace chat. Either one but they might have different results. If you've got an email address uh, with us, with meldpc.org.au, fair enough, click on the here. And that will take you to the best result. If you don't have an email address, and I don't know of anybody that doesn't yet, because it's only just started that we're deleting email addresses from new members, uh, we haven't had any new members signed in yet, as far as I'm aware. So what happens? Click there, uh, sorry, click here, or spaces. And it could take you to one or more different screens. The one on the left, verify that it's you, and lo and behold, that's a meldpc.org.au address. That's going to work. So you click on the send, enter, whatever it is. Can't do it from here. <laughs> next. <laughs> click on next. And that'll say sign in. And it gives me a couple of options. It'll be my gmail.com address or it'll give me my meldpc.org au address so I can sign in by selecting the correct address that I want to sign in on. So then I verify it's me and again I check and I can see there's a Mel PC address. Click next, enter the password, wonderful. So we're in in the member login, uh, we're, we're in, we can go open a new tab, go to the Meld PC website, click on the member login and we can get in this time by selecting the correct account.
after a delay should be logged in and you prove that you log in by seeing your name and the member login change to member dashboard. So that again worked. Uh, are there any questions? So initially when you log in, you, you've got this cased page and the login's not going to allow you to go through. It's, it's turning itself into some sort of Google logon. It is. In fact, what, what is happening there is that Google is saying, you've got a Gmail account, you've got a Workspace account, I don't know the difference, I'll grab whichever one you've got logged in already. Yeah, so if you've got your email open, for instance, it, it would um, look at that. Yes. Yeah, and then... If you've got that. it saved within the cache, it, the chances are it'll open it as well. Yeah, okay. The, the wrong account. It'll yeah. go for the gmail.com account rather than the MelPC account. Yeah, okay. It, it goes for whichever was in whichever it sees as being the most likely. Yeah, okay. But we don't see it that way at all. <laughs> yeah. So it's, so it's hard right in that initial point if someone's not able to log in. I say, what, what's going on? Yeah, it's all because the browser is, and Google is yeah. trying to make things easy for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, it's and try, trying to gain information of their own. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Any other questions? In Firefox, I've got the Mel PC bookmarked. Yes. So if I just click on that, I can just sign in, I assume. It depends on your bookmark. If your bookmark has mail.google.com slash a slash melpc.org.au. I've got no idea. <laughs> well, you can, you can edit it. Yeah, okay. Uh, but if you've got that, it'll go straight to the, the correct account. And it will also fill in the Mel PC part. So you just need to put in your username. Mm. And that's the link that we use on our website under the here on that page. Uh, if I go back there, if I can go back. On that page there, if you go for the, oh, it's still running. If you go to the left hand side, click on that link. If you hover over that link, you'll see what the link is. And if you reproduce that same link as your bookmark, edit your bookmark and put that link in there, it'll always go to the easy way. And that's logging into Google. That's not logging into the website. That's logging into Google. But once you're logged into Google, getting into the website is so much easier because it'll automatically see it. It'll give you a choice. Oh. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. Any other questions? being none. I the bookmark. I told a lie before. I said the meeting was going to formally close at nine o'clock and it's now ten past. So I shall now uh, formally close the meeting and uh, the, the questions and answers can continue, Stuart, so long as you're there and uh, people ask questions. But if anyone was expecting that we would finish at nine o'clock, please feel we won't, you, we won't be upset if you walk out. And, and 
very much. Thanks. And, and thank you very much, by the way, Stuart. I think uh, that's a, a very interesting topic, and anyone who does try to uh, uh, get in, you, you, you have to think twice. Uh, I do anyway, so this is helpful stuff. It's, it's a small thing, but uh, we have had a lot of people having trouble logging in. Um, I, I work in the office on occasions and people have rung in saying, I can't get into the website. Can I give you the credit card over the phone so that I can renew my membership? And yes, we do, but it's so much better for us in administration if people do uh, renew online because it, it just comes through automatically and we don't have to do any uh, other administration work. Um, it's so it's just so much easier. So thank you and I'll depart.